Exodus 16, 1 to 18. The whole Israelite community set out from Elim and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and then is to be, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to the Israelites, In the evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we that you should grumble against us? Moses also said, You will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses told Aaron, Say to the entire Israelite community, Come before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. While Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked toward the desert, and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. That evening quail came and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, what is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, it is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Each one is to gather as much as he needs. Take an omer for each person you have in your tent. The Israelites did as they were told and gathered much. Some gathered much, some little. And when they measured it by the omer, he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little did not have too little. Each one gathered as much as he needed. Then Moses said to them, no one is to keep any of it till morning. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until morning, but it was full of maggots and began to smell. So Moses was angry with them. Each morning, everyone gathered as much as they needed. And when the sun grew hot, it melted away. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much, two omers for each person. And the leaders of the community came and reported this to Moses. He said to them, this is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is to be the day of rest. It is a holy day to the Lord. So bake what you want to bake, boil what you want to boil, save whatever is left and keep it till morning. So they saved it until morning as the Moses commanded and it did not stink or get maggots in it. Eat it today, Moses said, because today is a Sabbath to the Lord. You will find you will not find any of it on the ground today. Six days you are to gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will not be any. Nevertheless, some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather it, but found none. Then the Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commands and my instructions? Bear in mind that the Lord has given you the Sabbath 
That is why on the sixth day he gives you bread for two days. Everyone is to stay where he is on the seventh day. No one is to go out. So the people rested on the seventh day. The people of Israel called the bread manna. It is white like coriander seed and tasted like waves made, wafers made from with honey. Moses said, that is what the Lord has commanded. Take an omer of manna and keep it, in, keep it for the generations to come so they can see the bread I gave you to eat in the desert when I brought you out of Egypt. So Moses said to Aaron, take a jar and put in it an omer of manna, then place it before the Lord to keep for the generations to come. As the Lord commanded, Moses, Aaron, put the manna in front of the testimony that it might be kept. The Israelites ate, Israelites ate manna for 40 years until they came to the land that was settled. They ate manna until they reached the border of Cana. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you both. A long, uh, longish reading from uh, Exodus this morning. Let's uh, try and get into it a little bit uh, and see what it might uh, be saying to us. So we're back in, uh, in Exodus for the next uh, few weeks before we uh, start looking at some of the Psalms. And here we are. The Israelites have been delivered from Egypt and saved from that pursuing Egyptian army by crossing the Red Sea or Sea of Reeds, as it can be interpreted and the Egyptian army has been drowned in the waters whilst trying to follow and capture them. These Israelites have seen the great power of the Lord and have feared the Lord and put their trust in him. Now fear here means to know, to recognise with awe God's holiness and power. So it's a positive sort of fear. It's like, I guess, standing in front of a an, an enormous mountain and just feeling the awesomeness of, uh, of what's before you. And then Moses and the Israelites have sung a wonderful song to the Lord to celebrate who he is and what he's done for them. Does that sound a bit familiar? Isn't that why we're here uh, this morning? To celebrate what God has done for us in song and in word. And uh, if you read uh, Exodus 15, just before our reading this morning, there's one part of the st song there uh, that stood out to me. I thought it really did speak about how we come to worship on a Sunday morning. Who among the gods is like you, O Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders? In your unfailing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed what a wonderful song and those lyrics we sort of were, were encaptured uh, in the song we sang at the beginning of the service and in our extended period worship a moment ago and so God's unfailing love continues to be with the Israelites as they journey through a desert the desert of Shur without finding water for three days then they come across a Mara where the water was undrinkable because it was bitter. Moses again cries to God for help and God shows him a piece of wood which he throws in the water making it sweet to drink. I suggest you don't try that with the river saw uh, unless you have a, a great uh, uh, faith uh, this morning. Their journey then continues to Elim, a place of 12 springs and 70 palm trees, a wonderful place to camp should be on the, uh, on the camping guide net somewhere. 12 springs and 70 palm trees. Elim. And that's the, uh, where the Elim Church takes their, their name from. You'd never realised it. I'm sure you had. They take their name from this oasis. But of course, uh, the Israelites don't stay there long, for this isn't the land of milk and honey that they had been promised you remember back in Exodus 3, 8, where it says, So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. 
This oasis of Elim isn't that place, good as it sounds. It got me thinking, I just wondered how sometimes perhaps we settle for things, good though they are, but not the things that God has promised us. How often do we get distracted by other things in our life, in our church life, distracted from our real purpose and real destination? Anyway, the Israelites leave Elim and the journey continues. First they head to the desert of Sin. Not Sin as in Sin, but an area called Sin. And here we are in the desert. So they've been saved from slavery in Egypt and God has wiped out the Egyptian army following them. But they find find themselves in a desert And rather than being a a thankful lot, they begin to grumble against Moses and Aaron. Had they forgotten the slavery of Egypt as they idolised the good points from their time there, as men do? There, we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted to. Seems unlikely as slaves, but there you go. But I guess better the devil you know. They even say that Moses has done this to them deliberately, I guess in the same way as he deliberately saved them from hardship, from slavery and from those ongoing deaths of their firstborn sons. But here they are in this desert. And I expect they think they're going to starve in this desert. They can't see a way forward. Only the predicament they seem to be in now. Ask yourself a a question. If you were to meet with them at this point as an advisor, as a consultant, what would you say to them? Perhaps. Yes, I'm sure God saved you miraculously from Egypt so that he could starve you to death in the desert. In the same way, God as we sang about earlier, has saved us from sin and darkness. He's brought us into the light. Has he done that just to abandon us? A pause for thought there, perhaps. For these Israelites, you could say that after everything that had happened to them, faith still wasn't part of their lives. Well, next, the Lord once again demonstrates his power, his glory, and his care for them. This morning, that tells us our God is a patient God, isn't he? Praise the Lord. And for them, he provides bread in the morning and quail for meat in the evening, the manna and the quail, the title for this morning's sermon. But, and here it comes again, the chance to put their faith in God again. An opportunity. I don't know, have you ever seen the film uh, Evan Almighty? Where um, God is played, of course, by Morgan Freeman. And he meets in a cafe, uh, he's sort of working as a waiter. And he meets with Evan's wife, who is having doubts about what her husband has been told by God to do to build a modern ark and it seems to be uh, splitting the family apart and uh, God, Morgan Freeman, says to her if you pray for patience does God give you patience or does God give you the opportunity to be patient If you pray for courage, he says, does God give you courage or the opportunity to be courageous? If you pray for a family to be closer, does God give you warm, fuzzy feelings or does he give the opportunity to love one another? Here God is giving these these Israelites an opportunity to be faithful and trusting bread in the morning meat in the evening but gather enough for just each day he's saying to them rely on me have faith in me trust me 
It sounds like a part of a prayer, a well-known prayer that we say each week. Give us this day our daily bread. I love it when the consistency of the Bible just sort of breaks out and shouts out to us from its pages. Give us this day our daily bread. Trust me. Have faith in me. Well, God answers the need of the Israelites in the desert for food so that they will know he is the Lord, your God. Does he work in our lives in the same way today? Do we let him? Again, a pause for thought. And so each family gathered as much as they needed for the day and didn't keep any uh, for the morning. I know it's a heroic and heroic way to live, trusting by faith in God's provision. What an heroic way to live. Except some didn't, of course, or tried not to, keeping the food overnight for the next day. Perhaps a lack of faith on their part. But this lack of faith was to no prevail for the food went off overnight. Not just went off. The Bible often really sort of says things quite starkly. It's a biblically went off. It uh, went rotten, full of maggots, and it smelled terrible. Nice. You wouldn't really want to eat that, would you, the next day? Perhaps another lesson here from our reading. Relying on our own resources, our own plans, our own strength isn't going to work in the end anyway. It's here also in this chapter of Exodus that we see the practical outworking of that pattern of the week that God has ordained in Genesis. After the creation was completed in six days, God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. And he applies this pattern here too in this desert. There is to be no gathering of food on the seventh day because that would be work. So the food, twice as much, is gathered on the sixth day. Twice as much meat is boiled and it doesn't rot overnight. The bread stays fine. It keeps. So that the Sabbath can be kept holy. So that they won't have to work and gather. Although again, some tried to, but there was nothing there. The Sabbath can be kept holy. This, of course, will be emphasised later in Exodus with the Ten Commandments. So they saved it until morning, and as Moses commanded, and it did not stink or get maggots in it. Some, perhaps most of them, are now beginning to really put their faith, their trust in God for their daily needs and their future. The lesson, the call for us this morning is to trust this same God in whatever circumstances we are in so that we will know that he is the Lord, our God. One final thing from that reading in Exodus. And in a way it relates to many of the festivals that we also celebrate each year and certainly to the celebration of Holy Communion that we keep to remind them and future generations of God's care, love, provision, and to remind them to keep putting their faith in God. They take an omer of manna and put it in a jar and place it before the Lord. That is, to keep it in the ark, the place of meeting with God. Why? Because you are to keep it for the generations to come so that they can see the bread I gave you to eat in the desert when I brought you out of Egypt. Our service of Holy Communion is like that, isn't it? It reminds us of the death of Jesus. We weren't there, but Christians have been doing this so that generations will know, be reminded of God's redeeming power in our lives today. There is one more twist 
for the Israelites. They ate manna for 40 years in the desert until they came into the promised land, the land of milk and honey. I did wonder about that, living in a desert for 40 years. Um, I only lived in Leicester for 35 years, I think, so I didn't quite make 40. Actually, Leicester's not that bad, really. But does it take, really, 40 years to really, really develop a true dependence on God, to develop a true faith and trust in God? We'll see a little bit more about that later on in Exodus. But as I was reflecting on that 40 years in the desert, it occurred to me that, yes, it can take a long time to deepen our faith in God, sometimes a lifetime of trusting for it to be more than just a theoretical faith, for it to become a close dependence on God daily, whatever our circumstances. That really resonated, really spoke to me as I prepared this talk. Sometimes faith takes time to grow. So don't give up. So to conclude, this wonderful story from Exodus, it really does, doesn't it, show us a lot about God and about humankind. About us, how quickly we grumble when times seem to become hard and when we can't exactly see how God will provide for us. How quickly we can lose our faith and trust in God but in his infinite patience, he once again shows us each time his power and his glory. About us, it tells us how often we resort to relying on our own strength, our own skills, our own resources, storing up what we think we need for the future to get us through. But how that ultimately will always fail. What does it tell us about God? It tells us that he's redeemed us, of course, saved us, that this is his purpose for his people throughout history. It tells us that he's been faithful throughout our life by his power and his glory, inviting us to put our trust and faith in him. He never lets us go, even when we fail. He leads us to the place that he's prepared for us in advance. For the Israelites, that was that land of milk and honey. For his people everywhere and throughout all time, as John's Gospel says, it's a room, a place in the Father's house. There's a song we sing sometimes called The Goodness of God. I think the lyrics of that really say it all about our reading this morning and the lessons perhaps that we can draw from it. It goes like this. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. God's goodness ran after the Israelites and it runs after us as we put our trust and faith in him day by day let's just pause for a moment and then I'll lead us in a very uh, short prayer that I invite you uh, to say together so let's pray together Lord help us to trust you for our needs day by day Help us to live more heroic lives of faith for your glory 
so that we may know that you are the Lord our God. Amen. We're going to worship now the God who runs after us, the God that we hunger for as we sing, Hungry, I come to you. Living for 